In May of 2021, JAXA astronaut Soichi Noguchi returned to Earth after a month's long stay at the International Space Station. He was sent up by Crew Dragon, a spacecraft developed by a company in the U.S. Civilians will start going to space from now on. And unless we enhance the quality of life in space, people won't be satisfied. The challenge of spaceflight, long steered by governments, is entering an age of civilians as the central players. In Japan, various projects are also being launched to ride this wave. According to a forecast by a U.S. investment bank, this new space business is seen to expand into a market worth over $870 billion by the 2040s. We go to the front lines of this burgeoning business. We arrive in Kodaira City, Tokyo. This is a corporate museum introducing the history of tire manufacturer Bridgestone and its future-oriented initiatives. Displayed are car tires, bicycles, and even racing cars. At first glance, this place appears unrelated to space, but further inside, There is an unusually massive tire. What is it for? It was actually conceived for lunar travel. They say it's designed to be fitted on a lunar cruiser and are aiming to commercialize it within this decade. The lunar cruiser being developed by JAXA and others is an essential vehicle for lunar exploration. This tire will serve as its feet. Measuring 1.5 meters in diameter, it entered development in 2018 after the company was approached by Toyota Motor for cooperation. Development is still ongoing. What exactly is different about it from a regular earthbound tire? We asked one of the managers. The first point is that there's no air in space. It's a vacuum. The second point is that there's cosmic radiation, high energy radiation, that you're constantly exposed to. Also, the temperature reaches 120 degrees Celsius during the day and drops to below minus 170 degrees at night. It's a place where using rubber or resins is quite difficult. The difference in temperature between day and night on the surface of the moon is nearly 300 degrees Celsius. To ensure it can withstand an extreme environment lacking air and exposed to cosmic radiation, they say the tire is completely made of metal. What's more? We've been told that a large area of the moon's surface is covered in a fine sand called regolith which means that it's not possible to move forward with steel tires as they'll dig into the sand and get buried. To make sure that doesn't happen, it's necessary to have very flexible tires. Regolith is fine sandy deposits covering the lunar surface. The idea for prevailing over this desert-like terrain came from... We wondered how the feet of camels are structured. They're big animals weighing 500 or 600 kilograms, walking effortlessly on fine desert sand with their thin legs. If you look at the backside of their feet, it's very soft. We got the idea from that, and in addition to the very flexible frame, we incorporated the concept of putting metal on the surface of the tire that's also very flexible, like this. Based on the image of the underside of a camel's feet, they cover the surface in soft steel wool, giving the tire flexibility without the need to fill it with air and reducing the hardness to about 1 25th that of conventional tires. As the tires sufficiently flatten, the area of contact with the lunar surface increases, allowing the tire to smoothly roll forward, much like a camel walking in the desert. They also adopted a double tire structure merging two tires into one to disperse contact pressure. Mm. 
No one knows what kind of tire is needed to achieve lunar missions. That was the start of our discussions with Toyota and JAXA. Making a tire suitable for that is not easy. We feel that the tire and the rover itself will lead to the next innovation and have a strong motivation to fully contribute to this effort. Meanwhile, in Azumino City, Nagano Prefecture, surrounded by nature, it's home to a company working to support satellites, harmonic drive systems, the company manufactures precision speed reducers built into robot arm joints. While not widely known, it's a crucial component that allows robot joints to move smoothly and powerfully. Such precision speed reducers are also indispensable for a range of equipment used in space. In space, the most common application is for the solar panels of satellites. Satellites have to constantly face the Earth. Low orbit satellites circle the Earth about 20 times a day. That means the solar panels need to be moved to always face the Sun 20 times. In recent years, they've been used for the Mars Exploration Rover, as well as Hayabusa 1 and Hayabusa 2. Space use precision speed reducers. They say it's not possible to use those designed for Earth. You can think of the mass of the fuel and metal as a can of juice. The amount of juice in the can is the fuel, and the can surrounding it is the metal. That's how much fuel you need in order to escape gravity. So the issue is reducing the amount of fuel needed for liftoff as much as possible. What's required is to control mass on the order of grams and make it light as possible. To minimize the load factor in liftoff, weight reduction on the order of grams is critical. Compared to this, we've removed quite a significant amount of bulk to realize weight reduction. It's about two-thirds of what it was before. The metal was shaved while retaining its strength, with the weight of the precision speed reducer cut from 310 grams to 221 grams. They also made various improvements, including switching to materials that don't emit toxic gases because of temperature changes for the internal components. This type of fine-tuned manufacturing is expected to support space businesses in the future. Until recently, space use gear didn't even account for 0.2% of our total sales. As a business, it wasn't palatable. The manufacturing is difficult and volumes are limited. But we expect space-related business to grow in the future and give birth to even more applications. We also see volumes growing as well. They say space-related sales have been increasing 15% annually in recent years. Japanese manufacturers are working to further enhance their technologies to also capture the space market. Nihonbashi, Tokyo. This neighborhood once thrived as the starting point of the five major roads of Edo, such as the Tokaido. It's also emerging as the launch pad for space businesses. Cross Nihonbashi Tower opened in 2020. From Nihonbashi to space, we were allowed to tour Cross Nihonbashi Tower to learn more. Beyond the art object in the lobby is the office of JAXA, the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency. Being carried out here is a research and development program called JSPARC that was launched in 2018. 
It's an initiative through which JAXA supports space-oriented companies create new businesses. They've partnered with more than 30 companies to date. For example, they've collaborated with a company producing emergency-use non-perishable food to develop jelly-type space food. as well as a manufacturer of remote-controlled robots to open a video link between the International Space Station and Earth. A vast range of results has been achieved. What we need to do going forward is to incorporate the strengths of companies and the technologies and expertise they've cultivated to create new businesses. The field of space development will continue expanding there's a limit to what JAXA can accomplish by itself. And it's essential that we work together with companies and various other players. The sixth road leading to space. At its starting point, initiatives drawing on the strengths of companies are underway. Cross Nihonbashi Tower, the launch pad of space businesses in Nihonbashi, Tokyo, what we found here is a mission control center. Going inside. Hello. Hello. What kind of place is this? This is a mission control center for lunar modules. Space Venture, iSpace, is making preparations for a lunar exploration program. This is the lunar rover that'll be used. It's a small unmanned vehicle controlled remotely. Several will simultaneously roam the surface to survey and mine resources. This is the control room to operate those rovers. We're scheduled to start lunar missions this year and what you could call the health of the modules is shown on the screen. The monitor displays metrics such as the voltage and remaining fuel of the rovers. The information will arrive from the lunar surface with about a five second delay, allowing for precise control. This is the first lunar exploration program in Japan to be launched by a company. The countdown to that moment has begun. The module is currently being assembled in Germany. It will be completed by the first half of this year, with the launch taking place in the second half. We're in the final phase now. Going further into the control room, we see a number of company logos on the wall. What are they? These are our partners cooperating in the Hakuto R program. For example, Mitsui Sumitomo Insurance is developing a product called Space Insurance. What exactly is Space Insurance? It supports entry into space. For example, if we're talking about satellites, how are unexpected space risks or landing failures reimbursed? We want to provide support with insurance, and that's why we're developing space insurance. Expecting the space business to expand in the future, they're proposing space insurance to support activities on the moon. They discuss the requirements on the basis that conditions differ from Earth. For example, say you drive a car on the moon, there aren't any traffic laws like you have on Earth. It's a world where we don't even know what kind of accidents to expect. So, absent laws, what should our insurance insure? There's no oxygen on the moon, so there probably won't be fires. But there's oxygen inside lunar facilities, so there may be fires inside those facilities. Differences with the Earth like this will mean it will be a new type of insurance. 
Mitsui Sumitomo Insurance set up a team of experts in 2014 to create various types of space insurance. For instance, insurance related to launches. They say the liability limit differs according to the type of rocket. They also have insurance for when rovers break down or in the event of a collision with space debris. Currently, around 30 companies around the world offer space insurance. Mitsui Sumitomo Insurance forecasts the market will be 10 times bigger than now by 2030. Meanwhile, at Space Venture, Space BD. At first glance, it appears to be a typical company. What kind of company is Space BD? We call ourselves a general space trading company. What exactly is a space trading company? Satellites are becoming smaller in size and sent up by rockets or carried to the International Space Station and released. We act as middlemen and find the necessary method to launch into space and also provide assistance in terms of technology. Our main work is matching rockets and satellites, plus offering technical support. This general space trading company handles everything from procuring satellites to arranging rocket launches. They've been involved in the launch of more than 50 satellites to date. They say in recent years, a large number of requests has been on using satellites to monitor the Earth and collect data. What prices do they charge? The least expensive launch is about $43,000 to $87,000. That's not as expensive as I thought. That's right. A small satellite weighing less than 100 kilograms can be launched for under $100,000. They say the use of such satellites is also becoming more diverse. There's quite a big demand for testing out new technologies. So in the case of testing small sensors in space, we can put those sensors on our adapters in space for tests and bring them back. We've won exclusive usage rights for what's called the extravehicular section from JAXA. Some companies are even sending products they develop to the International Space Station to carry out durability tests. For example, how will quick drying glue change in space? Or can a diamond withstand a zero gravity vacuum environment? The needs of customers vary. Until now, space has been used for scientific and technological research. But as commercial use expands, we need to develop new uses for space that we haven't thought about before. That will lead to broadening the scope of industries. New services in the unexplored world of space. As the barriers to entry fall, the possibilities are infinite. Competition in this new frontier has only just begun. <laughs>